Hi, and welcome to this third episode of my series that I've called, What? So What? Now What? And in the first episode, we looked at um, the changing nature of society over the last 60 years and the dramatic impact that it has had, it has had and continues to have on the church, especially mainline church here in Canada. Second week, we looked at uh, the model of church that has worked for hundreds of years that we've inherited and why it's not working now. And then we looked at the, the missional church model as an alternative for our time. This week, now what? We're going to be exploring uh, congregations that are emerging as different from traditional congregations, how they are expressing their faith, how the, the priorities they have in their congregational life. As we've seen, uh, congregations have tended to um, ask a strategic question of how do we cope with what's happening to us? And the priority has been to maintain the style of church that has been meaningful to those who are already a part of the congregation. But 60 years of experience has shown us that Simply focusing on maintaining a congregation does not actually maintain the congregation. So last week we explored that missional church model, and uh, today we're going to be looking at congregations that are being missional. Not just them, we're going to look at a host of churches that are what you could call emergent congregations. Uh, Congregations are, are doing the new thing. Not all are missional. Now, it's vital to, to note here, what these congregations are doing is not a church growth strategy. These congregations are not making these changes as a church growth strategy. This is an evolution in being church. These congregations are leaning into the two great summaries of the law that we hear about in the Gospels, to, to know and love God and to love neighbor. Some of these congregations, they are, they are pursuing one of these priorities. Some are trying to do both. Many result from seeing the need that we have uh, to be better evidence for the existence of God in our ever more secular society. And they're also considerate of the generation of church that is following us. What can we do now for the sake of them? What these congregations are doing is moving away from being congregations of habit to becoming congregations of intention. And that is probably the best, simplest explanation that describes how congregations are pivoting today. Lauren Mead, as we heard um, 30 years ago, wrote, the transformation that the church is seeing now may well make the Reformation look like a ripple on a pond. It will take generations but we must begin now. And in the 30 years since he wrote that book, we can see a growing number of examples of congregations that are making that transformation, doing that reformation. It is hard for us to imagine the church making such a transformation themselves, ourselves, for sure. But it's not the first time that the people of God have faced dramatic cha challenges in their society and have evolved in response. We can see this particularly in the Old Testament with the, the Babylonian conquest. 6th century BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire uh, started to have an impact on uh, the, the nation of Judah, uh, what was the southern uh, country of the two portions of the two kingdoms of the Israelite people. 
And uh, eventually, in three or sorry, 587 BC, uh, the Babylon the Babylonians con conquered Jerusalem and Judah, and it was a dramatic, dramatic change for the people of this country. They tore down the Babylonians tore down the walls of the city of Jerusalem, so the city couldn't defend itself. They destroyed the temple, which was the heartbeat of their faith, and they took many of uh, the con of the cities and of the nation's leadership and craftspeople, craftsmen, off into captivity in Babylon. What has happened to us in our time? Many commentators say that it's almost analogous to the Babylonian exile many years ago. And here's a Psalm uh, 137. You may not hear it too often in church, but it reflects uh, the feelings of people uh, as they were being hauled away from Jerusalem to exile in Babylon. And we read, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept as we remembered Zion, Jerusalem. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us to sing songs, and our tormentors asked with mirth, saying, Sing us one of your songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You know, think about how the people felt in that moment. Their city destroyed, the temple destroyed, now being carted off into captivity. This echoes a sense of dispirit, of dispirited spirit, of hopelessness. But then as people, um, as we read on in the end of this psalm, uh, in the, the concluding verses, we read, O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall be they who pay you back for all you have done for us. Happy shall they be who take your children and dash them against the rocks. Incredibly violent expression here of, of deep anger because of the immense loss that uh, the people of Judah were feeling being hauled off into captivity. And their sense of loss was very, very real. The core symbols of their identity and faith practice were now gone. And it looked permanent. And it felt devastating. The Babylonian conquest created a very deep crisis of faith for the people of Judah. The temple was gone. This was the hub for their worship. The demolition of the walls of Jerusalem, they could no longer protect themselves. Exile to Babylon meant that they were removed from the promised land, the land God promised to Abraham, the land that God helped the Exodus people go back to and reclaim. And they began to ask themselves, are we no longer God's chosen people? And then they asked a deeper question. And did we bring this upon ourselves by our unfaithfulness? After all, Old Testament prophets had been warning for some time that the Jews were not being faithful enough uh, to God's law. And, and they even warned that such a thing as the Babylonian conquest could happen. So this was a critical question. And... In response, they decided to do something about it. They did not go into Babylon and captivity simply as a defeated people, but they utilized their time there to redefine how they practiced their faith. They pivoted. And they redefined to something that was more meaningful to them, in their faith, a more 
they thought, authentic expression of faithfulness. And so some of those things that they did, uh, they became more uniformly mono, monotheistic. Um, in the earlier days of uh, the Jewish faith practice, many Jews uh, worshipped you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God, but they also hedged their bets by worshipping other more local gods as well. So in this time of exile, they became more focused on exclusive worship to God. Faithfulness can no longer be about what happened in the temple because they didn't live there anymore. The temple was gone. And so faithfulness shifted to an emphasis of obeying the law. And uh, in part because they began to believe that what happened to them in the conquest was a consequence of their lack of fidelity to the law. They needed to provide some guidance to people. So how do you live out this law? And so um, the canon of Jewish scripture, what we call the Old Testament, started to form and um, become more important to them. What uh, is called the Torah today, first five books of the Old Testament, the book of the law, the Torah was, became widely accepted as an authoritative teaching after the Babylonian exile um, during the Persian period. But it started the shift during Babylon itself. So we're going to follow the law. People needed to know in practical terms how to actually do that. Follow what the Torah says. And so they developed a cadre of teachers, um, rabbis. And those rabbis morphed in time into the Pharisees. And since worship was no longer possible in the temple, and you needed to learn about the law, they created places to meet, to worship, to learn, that in time became called synagogues. Now, the least things sound familiar. Um, it sounds a lot like the kind of Judaism practiced in Jesus' day. And all that had its beginning in the time of Babylonian exile. What had appeared to the Jewish people and captured in Psalm 137 as the very end of their faith was actually the very beginning of a new understanding of faith. Many commentators uh, say that the church today in our society is having its own exile experience. But I, like many, think that these times are our new entry into a new way of living out Christianity. And I think the choice before us is much the same as before uh, the exiled Jews. Do we succumb? to mourning the loss of what has been meaningful? Do we believe that we are powerless to do anything in response? Or are we willing to be reformed? Let's not forget our history. The church today is a product of many significant reforms throughout its history. Jesus brought a, a brand new perspective on Judaism and Christianity grew out of that as the ultra-reformed form of Judaism. In the 11th century AD, the Roman Catholic Church was changing a lot and evolving, so much so that the Roman Catholic Church of Eastern Europe split off to become the Orthodox Church. Recently, we marked the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's birth. The 19th century saw the emergence of what we call the evangelical church today. The 20th century saw the emergence of Pentecostalism. The old way that we had for seeing church uh, was um, built on that attractional model of church. Now my view is that uh, the emerging ways of some congregations, a growing number of congregations, 
in this city and across the country. The emerging way is more transformational. After all, Christianity is actually intended to foster change everywhere in personal life and social life, in congregational life. And emerging congregations are taking far, far more seriously the two great summaries of the law that we are to know and love God and love our neighbor. Emerging congregations believe faithfulness is about uh, is the primary purpose of a congregation, not maintenance, but faithfulness. And that kind of faithfulness prompts them to be transformed and transforming the, the core purpose of congregations. And these people in these congregations also see what's happening in our secular society and trying to transform in a way to be more relevant to the secular society and becoming in this way greater evidence for the existence of God. And so the transformation that's happening here I would summarize very simply as congregations that are going inward and congregations that are going outward. Going inward congregations focus on personal spiritual development, and that's the transformation. Going outward congregations, uh, it's about living your life as a Christian and living your life as a congregation so that the society beyond the church is transformed. That's the missional church model. So let's dive into looking at some of these. And I want to look at going inward churches first that give primary emphasis to facilitating personal spiritual growth. The transformation takes place in the individual. The witness is people seeing a Christian change in their lives because they engage with God. So a first group I want to highlight in this is uh, we have in Calgary Christian congregations that are focused on spirituality but are purposefully blurring the outer boundary of their congregation to make the place uh, a place where people who don't believe in God or have a very vague notion of God can come in and participate in the life of the church and do so with a great deal of comfort in a non-judgmental, inclusive setting. These congregations can seem more Unitarian, so less Christocentric. And these congregations can even say that they're open uh, to having people live within their midst, people who are agnostic or atheists. These congregations typically still read the Bible. Uh, they sing Christian songs, but nowhere as near Christocentric as you know, a, a Reformed family of churches congregation like a Presbyterian church is. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. First one is in northwest or southwest Calgary, not far from our congregation. It's called Friends Church. Its focus is spiritual growth. It's located in Britannia. And they say, quote, We will not argue about aspects of the faith that cannot be proven. Think about what that really means. Can we prove the existence of God? Not like you could with a scientific method. So they're not going to argue about that. That's a pretty dramatic, bold statement. They call themselves a spiritual gym. They want to facilitate every individual's unique spiritual journey from wherever they start to wherever they are going with no uh, guardrails on that. No way of saying we want it to be shaped by Jesus, they just want you to be on the journey. Uh, a Sunday that I was there, uh, they were focused on how to use the spiritual practice of journaling. 
as a means of growing in, in your own personal spirituality. Uh, average worship runs around 90 people on a Sunday. From their website, it says, We know uh, that not everyone fits a traditional church. Hell, most of us don't fit a traditional church. But most of us also want spirituality in our lives. French Church can help you find your unique spiritual journey, a journey that not only connects you to something more, connects you to something more, capital M. You know, that's a word replacement for God. Just connect you to something more. But will change your entire life and hopefully will change your entire world for the better. Some of us in this congregation who are part of this congregation some of us are theists, we believe God exists, and some don't. We are a diverse community, and everyone, no matter what you believe, where you came from, or who you are, as long as you love the people around you, you're welcome. So very, a Christian congregation that has really erase the lines of the boundary around it to make the, it, this a place where people can um, come in, explore spirituality, even if it's not going to be from a Christ-centered perspective. Another congregation that's somewhat like this is Hillhurst United. Reverend John Pentland there says, not everyone is religious, but all people are spiritual deepening our spiritual lives and connection with God, however you understand that word, God, however you understand the word God, means we live a more meaningful, grounded, and generous life. That's a very open and inclusive kind of statement. I think they create what anthropologists call a liminal space, spiritually. Oh, big word. What's that mean? It's um, to be on liminal is to be on the threshold of something new, but not quite there yet. And they're creating that liminal space where people can come in and be a part of this congregation, not necessarily feel any inclination towards Christianity, but still find it's a place to grow spiritually and bump up against the Christian faith. You know, to my observation, Hillhurst seems to straddle a place um, that is kind of well, that is both Christian but welcoming and inclusive of Unitarians. Um, Unitarians just believe in God alone, not you know Jesus was, was not a part of God, but they seem to straddle a space there and to create a place where people can be influenced by Christianity. Now, there's a second group that's doing stuff like this. And um, much of the dismissing of Christianity in our society comes from people who do not see any evidence for the existence of God as they look around in their world. And so we have congregations in Calgary that are putting a special focus on addressing this need. How can we go about helping people see God. And that's the driving point. The Road Church in Northwest Calgary um, is meeting in what was Rocky View or Rocky Mountain College. Um, they are a, a congregation of the Christian Reformed Church. But I would, I would say that uh, they would probably label themselves as post-evangelical and they're also pretty liberal leaning theologically both things that, you know, the Christian Reformed Church may not, you know, be, you know, 100% on. But their mission statement, the Road Church is an accepting community called to experience and to be God's presence everywhere. So their core purpose is to help people experience God and then in their lives express God's presence everywhere. On their website, it says, we are Christ-centered, 
diverse and a gifted community with a curious spirit that keeps us praying with open eyes, ears, and hearts. There is intentional space for questions, for uncertainty, and for mystery. They're trying to be very non-dogmatic, uh, something that historically the Christian Reformed Church has been pretty dogmatic about what is, what's true about belief. They're trying to be very non-dogmatic. This summer, they, had a, they promoted a reflection practice, and they provided six different exercises to, that you could blend together to uh, grow in your mindfulness practice as you experience nature. Just be mindful of, of uh, you know, the, the way the air smells and the beauty of nature and the sounds of nature but also to practice the presence of God, how to, be, how to open your sense of mindfulness to God's presence in your life. Another congregation that is working this way is Marta Loop Church. Uh, John Van Sloten is their pastor. Uh, their purpose, Marta Loop Church exists to help people engage God everywhere. Again, coming to experience the presence of God, engage God everywhere. For years and years, uh, John's teaching ministry has revolved around uh, how do you, where do you see God in life? How can you see God in life? And, um, and it's had a, his goal is a transformative one. Um, if you can help people appreciate that God is there, to even see God at work in the world, then that's going to help transform your life and transform how you live life. Um, and so he orients his teaching very consistently around, you know, how to see God in dot, dot, dot. And a Sunday I was there um, at the beginning of the downturn of the oil industry uh, a sermon that day was finding God through unemployment. That's the kind of orientation he has. Or finding God in the Human Genome Project. One of my favorite stories about um, John Van Sloten is um, he was doing a series and one of the uh, about uh, finding God in popular music. And one of uh, the sermons was going to be uh, uh, finding God in the music of Metallica. Now, for those who don't know, Metallica is pretty much a, uh, a very heavy, heavy metal band. And he, he was going to focus on them and their music and how you can find God even in the lyrics of Metallica. This is advertised on their website. Upcoming series. Upcoming topic. And so... Uh, one day, the phone rings, he picks it up. Man introduces himself as the manager of the band Metallica. And he said, we have a service that just always, you know, searches the web to see, you know, how people are speaking about our band and how people are representing our band, criticizing the band and such. And we found your website and your announcement. Is it true? He asked that you plan to preach on finding God in the music of Metallica. John panicked because he could just see some lawsuit coming, but he said, yes. And the manager of the band said to him, well, the band is really interested in this because they all believe that you can see God in their music. And they were wondering if it would be all right if they come and attend that worship service. They're gonna be playing a concert the night before, um, not that far away, they can fly in, be there for the service. And John said, great. Well, a few weeks later, got another phone call from the manager said, sorry, no can do. Things in their schedules changed, they can't fly into Calgary for this. But we have a request, could we send a film crew to record that whole service so they can watch it later. And John thought about that and asked, 
can we have a copy of that movie for us to use too? And the answer was, of course. But that's the kind, that's just this crazy story about a guy who, this preacher, whose emphasis is always about, you know, how can you, how can we develop uh, the sense of appreciation, uh, the, the sense of you know, being able to see in a way that will be able to look for God in all these different aspects of our life. The final group of these uh, you know, uh, inward congregations focusing on spirituality, these are congregations that are actually trying to grow in traditional Christian spiritual practice. And, um, and so I want to talk about, first, Oak Ridge Presbyterian Church. You recall that um, Reverend Tim is headed to this congregation, and he starts his first service on May 1st. There's the building, there's a bunch of the people there. I served this church for nine years. One of uh, the ministers on staff was Reverend Sabrina Caldwell. And Sabrina, uh, for many, many years, been a part of a, of a program that trained spiritual directors that had a national presence in Canada. And a couple of times a year, she would fly to Vancouver and teach in this program. We were interested at, in Oak Ridge in helping people on their spiritual journey. So we asked Sabrina to train 10 people in the congregation to be spiritual directors. And so these spiritual directors had a volunteer ministry in the midst of our congregation to help people on their own spiritual journey. Uh, a very you know, traditional, traditional Roman Catholic, originally, spiritual practice. Another congregation that's very cool about all this is the Emmaus community in Victoria. This is an outgrowth of an Anglican church in the city there. And um, they have an intentional shared spiritual life. Uh, they take their cues from the practices of you know, monasteries of the Middle Ages. And they, they are gathered people who are willing to share a spiritual life together. I believe they, one of the things they do there is to uh, create um, a habit of prayer where even the prayers can be uh, pre-written, handed out to people. And then at certain points every day, people stop whatever they're doing in their lives, say at 10 o'clock in the morning, and they pray that prayer. They pray that prayer along with everybody else in the congregation. They're just not gathered in a monastery like in days of old. They could be at home or in their workplace. They develop this rule or rhythm for their spiritual life and become accountable to each other in their growth and faith. They, they also tried, like monasteries of old, to be um, an aid to people living in the neighborhood, to express love in the neighborhood. And the congregation is made up of everything from senior citizens right down to children. If you're training to be a, an Anglican priest in Canada, you can take a course in new monasticism, which is what this approach to Christianity is called, and it's practiced all around North America now. Something else they do is called Supper Church. This was uh, created first by an Anglican church in New York City, and it's become something that's practiced all over the place in the world, especially among Anglicans. And um, one Anglican priest, and Calgary had a, a supper church uh, congregation that floated around, before the pandemic, was floating around different churches in Calgary. Uh, Varsity Acres was, I signed us up to be the host for supper church one night so we could introduce it to the people. And about uh, three weeks before they came to Varsity, the pandemic shut it all down. Uh, but the practice is that uh, you gather, people gather on, say, like a Wednesday night. Those who arrive first, there's provisions for the meal for everyone. They start cooking 
as people come in tables are set up you know plates are set out others join in the cooking uh, activities are put on to keep kids uh, involved and then they all sit down at table for a common meal over the table they actually do a bit of singing they do some prayer they have a scripture reading and they have a conversation around the meaning of that passage and then at the end of the meal they take wine and bread from the table and they celebrate the Eucharist supper church so what do we see here these are congregations that are growing in their um, emphasis, becoming intentional about helping people know and love God and to pursue actively their own personal spiritual journeys, making spiritual practice a core element of congregational life. Um, some facilitating the practice, spiritual practices, very traditional Christian, others um, that are not going that way at all, but to make the congregation a place of great comfort for anyone of whatever spiritual belief they hold. But in both ways, trying to help people develop a point of view that appreciates that God does exist and is present to them and is knowable. And in a society that the culture of a society being so corrosive to the Christian faith, where um, a growing number of people are just not convinced that God exists, what a better way than this, than to, to create a stronger faith in individuals, but also in that transformation of individuals, that they can um, become examples of the Christian faith, become better evidence for the existence of God. I'd like to shift over to the other group, uh, those that are going outward. And these are uh, congregations of intention whose focus is transforming the wider neighborhood, the community. And so these congregations tend to be more missional in their self-understanding. And the transformation these congregations seek is to help, you know, um, in Jesus' words, uh, Jesus said, you know, I come to bring life and to bring it in abundance. And so in many different ways, these congregations are trying to foster a more abundant life in the wider neighborhood. And through their own actions, people seeing Christianity on display, um, they become evidence for the existence of God and what they do. Last week, uh, I told them the story of Lake Ridge Church in Chestermere, but I want to cover a whole bunch of other ones too, real quick. One um, is Converge. Converge existed from 2009 until 2016. There were three house churches um, in Calgary that would meet weekly as their own little house church, but twice a month, the three of them banded together for corporate worship. And they were uh, a, a collection of missional church-minded house churches. And uh, the home group focus was on you know, how do we live our lives in such a way uh, that we can be an influence on the people who live immediately around my own home, like the 10 houses around us. And the house churches were focused on uh, supporting each other uh, in doing just that. But the, the Converge service was really, really interesting. Uh, there's, uh, there's no clergy. Uh, the services were all lay-driven. Uh, I went to one service and it looked like this. Um, we began with singing a song from the band U2. U2 has a lot of songs that reflect the Christian faith. All members of the band are Christian. Then we had um, prayer. A couple, one couple wrote uh, uh, their own edition of an Old Testament psalm, put it to music, and they sang that. Um, we had communion. Uh, 
people, we started communion with the great prayer of thanksgiving, which is the big prayer that we have all the time in our communion service. It's from the second century AD. They had a corporate uh, prayer of confession, which they, which was on the screen and they read together. Um, when they went up for communion, they went up, people went up in pairs and served each other. A scripture passage was projected on the screen. It was read, and a couple of discussion questions were put up. And then, because there's no preacher, uh, they broke into little discussion groups, and they discussed those questions. And then, as each discussion group wrapped up, they just drifted off to the potluck lunch they were all going to share. The Sunday I was there, there were 60 people in, in present, and a third of them were children under the age of 12. But, but the thing was, so it's a very, that is contemporary worship, blending what is ancient with what is modern, and uh, that is also a missional church, because the house church groups were trying to help each other have an influence on their immediate neighborhoods. Another example is uh, Cypher Church, or Cypher Church. Cypher Church grew out of Converge when Converge um, met its natural end. And they started Cypher Church originally rooted um, in the creative art, arts and the hip hop community. So, thus the tagline, calling all outsiders. Today, Cypher Church is a highly diverse, multi-ethnic congregation that focuses on helping the people in the congregation live out the character of Jesus in their own neighborhood. That is, uh, the missional focus is, um, again, one-on-one -on -one here. And they say, uh, in when they talk about the uh, emphasis of that missional focus, they write, to live out the fullness of their humanity by going deeper into things that matter, fighting for justice, creating be beauty, restoring brokenness, and discovering a deeper loving community. Another missional congregation is Presbyterian, and Two Rivers Church in my hometown of Guelph. Glenn Soderholm is the minister there, and he started this network of house churches. The goal was to create house churches for only the unchurched and the non-Christian. Guelph has a lot of Presbyterian churches, and um, people are always coming to Glen saying, I've heard you're doing this. I want to leave my current Presbyterian church and help you. And he would say, thank you, but no. This is a church for the unchurched. <laughs> and he would just turn people away who want to join. He started by making himself the chaplain to the downtown businesses, and he got to know the shopkeepers and was a support to them, building community among them. After a few years, they named him the president of the Downtown Business Association, even though he doesn't have a business downtown. It was a slow takeoff, but now they have four living rooms, they call them, house churches that meet twice per month. The worship is highly creative. Um, Glenn Stewart's a professional musician, songwriter, and they blend um, uh, ancient worship practices with a, a mix of contemporary and, and artistic practices as well. It's highly eclectic worship. They have a missional orientation from their website. Our intention is to participate in what God is already doing. God's on God's mission in the world. We're going to participate in it. Classic statement. To participate in what God is already doing by being faithfully present through the Spirit to our neighbors and beyond. The missional expression here, again, is individual. By congregants becoming involved in things like community gardening, Newcomer language groups, serving food and shelters, ref, refugee health, health, healthy transportation, neighborhood groups. A more programmatic example, Presbyterian again, St. Paul's Presbyterian Church in Ottawa. 
This was a few years ago. I don't think this program exists anymore. But the youth minister at the time uh, saw a trend among teens in general that really disturbed him. You know, he saw a rise in bullying, and he saw in teens a low level of empathy. So he wanted to develop a program to strengthen empathy in young people. And so they created at St. Paul's Church a monthly drop-in social program for youth with autism. And these youth with autism, you know, sometimes feel socially awkward in groups. And these groups were uh, created, this program was created to help them grow in some life skills, to have fun socially. And that program was being offered by youth. Youth from the church, youth from outside the church. And um, they were engaging with these uh, other teens. And through that engagement and trying to, to be a help, um, they were able to develop a greater sense of empathy in themselves. And so those who were uh, being supported by this program and those who are offering the program were growing in different ways, but growing equally. Just some others, quickly. Uh, the Church of the City, Toronto, an intentional startup of a new congregation, now in two locations, I think, uh, where the focus of the congregation is highly missional, programmatic by the congregation, and they're running programs in neighborhoods where there's a high number of kids at risk, in various risks. And so they're running programs uh, to encourage the, the kids and, and help them mature well for, for living in society. Uh, we are going to be hearing um, on our uh, weekend with uh, uh, Dr. Tim Dickow about uh, Grandview Baptist Church in Vancouver. I won't say anything more about that, but they're great, great, great illustration of what can happen. Medicine Hat, Hillcrest Church, big uh, evangelical contemporary congregation, and uh, they have uh, a furniture ministry. No idea how they got started, but they, they started collecting up free donations of furniture. They they purchased all these uh, shipping containers that are stacked outside and it's filled up with all this furniture. And then people um, who have a need for furniture can call and, and, and get a, don a donation of a piece free. Agencies in the town know about this and, and they will refer people to um, Hillcrest Church. Uh, for furniture, and it's become a very prominent practice that the, the church is doing as a ministry together. Pres Paris Presbyterian Church in Paris, Ontario. Um, they started this really intriguing thing you may have heard of. Uh, it's pretty famous within our denomination, and it's, um, it's about carrot soup. And uh, they uh, brought some developmentally challenged adults together form a, a company making soup, uh, a few different kinds of soup. And, and then that goes up for sale. And, and then uh, the people who are the employees of the company are getting an income. And so the congregation created this company. Uh, it's now, um, it, there's about, I think about eight different uh, uh, carrot soup companies around southwestern Ontario uh, that are mostly operated out of churches, but some out of um, other groups, non-church groups. Uh, two things that you may be aware of because they're big deals in the city. Um, First Baptist Church began a ministry to the homeless in their their main hall. And that eventually grew into the Mustard Seed, which is still very much a Christian organization, but it's a huge, huge thing in our city, helping the homeless and those with addiction issues. 
And uh, that, that was just birthed as a simple program within First Baptist Church and just grew beyond what anyone could imagine. Another place is um, Central United Church, downtown Calgary. Uh, Central uh, was, uh, you know, decades ago, was a, a downtown church with no parking and, um, and the in decline. And, um, and they had two ministers. The senior minister retired. And the board, leadership of the church, went to Reverend Michael Ward and said, listen, we can only afford to have one minister now. So if you're willing, you can be that one minister or... If you don't want to be the solo pastor here, then you'll have to leave and we'll call someone who will be. Michael stayed. Uh, he went to, a, a, and, and he stayed knowing this was the trajectory of the church. He went to um, a conference and was ignited in his imagination of what could happen. And he came back and told the leadership, you know, if we're going to go out, let's go out with a bang rather than a whimper. And they decided to think about, you know, how can we have a ministry to those in our immediate neighborhood? This was before the idea of missional church was even in anyone's imagination. And so they asked the question, well, who is in need of ministry in our neighborhood? And the answer was, well, we've got, you know, addicts and we have street people. So they developed programs for addiction. One of the programs they developed was the Sunday night worship service, which is built on the model of the 12-step program. To this day, the seven the evening Sunday evening worship service is the only authorized AA meeting in the world that is a worship service. And the last time I looked, the attendance in the evening was higher than the attendance Sunday morning. And when I did a research project in 2005 on the big churches of Calgary, um, uh, Central United had the 10th largest worshiping congregation in the city. They've also been very involved in other aspects of um, missional church. And they were a very big part of creating In From the Cold. And they had a very big part in creating cups, which we're all familiar with here. So intentional model congregations. These are emerging style congregations that have shifted from being congregations of habit to being congregations of intention. And those intentions have focused around one or both of the great summaries of the law, to know and love God and to love your neighbor. And these congregations are in the business of making transformation happen. For the going inward congregations, it's about helping people change spiritually. For the going outward congregations, it is people going into the neighborhood to help people in the neighborhood have greater life in abundance. So I want you to do some reflection. You know, did any of these stories sound appealing to you? In our own congregation's DNA, are we more oriented to be like an inward church that helps develop people's sense of spiritual practice, spirituality, or we are, or are we more of an outward church, missionally minded, that wants to transform the neighborhood? And did you hear something here that you think your own church might want to explore? So muse on that and perhaps have a conversation with someone else from your congregation to, um, to explore those kind of possible futures for your church.